It is the afternoon of June 28, 2007. I'm Don Linke. We're here this afternoon uh, to conduct another in the series of video interviews for the Brendan T. Byrne Archive of the Rutgers Program on the Governor. We'll be talking with Betty Wilson, who is currently chair of the State Pinelands Commission uh, and has been a member of the commission since 2002 and chair since 2005. Uh, during the uh, time of uh, Governor Brendan Byrne, uh, she was a state assemblywoman, also later was deputy and assistant commissioner of the Department of Environmental Protection, then later became an official in the U.S. Department of Interior, and has also held a a diverse range of nonprofit uh, positions in New Jersey and also positions in local government. Uh, so we'll be talking now with Betty Wilson. Betty, uh, you're one of the uh, female pioneers in New Jersey politics. Uh, why don't you uh, start with telling us how you decided to become politically active? Well, that's a big question. It's a long time ago. Um, but I was, um, I was in college, and uh, I was a, a woman who went back to college after I had a family, so I was in college in the 60s. And uh, really, my, my awakening occurred then. Uh, before that, I didn't really uh, have any involvement in politics in any real way. But it was the time of uh, civil rights, and, and um, uh, the anti-war movement began. And I began to get very involved, both as a as a teacher and and then at, in, in, at the political level uh, in local politics uh, up in Union County in Berkeley Heights and um, just developed from that. Was there an issue that really got you uh, interested? Was it race? Was it uh, other liberal uh Topics. Well, it was it was race certainly. Uh, certainly, the civil rights the civil rights movement was first in terms of my um, my uh, forming my thinking. Um, I had some excellent professors in college who uh, nurtured that, and uh, and then then the war. It was uh, you know it was, it was the late 60s, and uh, uh, there was so much ferment, and even though um, I was. Eight, from an age standpoint, somewhat older than the the, the, the usual college crowd, I was very much uh, a part of that way of thinking at that time. So it was, I would say, it was uh, it was racial justice and uh, poverty and the war, the Vietnam War. Now, who suggested that you still that you you run for local office? Well, we were we were looking for a Democrat. Uh, uh, the previous year, I, as soon as I moved into my house in Berkeley Heights, the first thing I did was to go to a political meeting. I saw it advertised in the local paper, and I went and joined up with some people who I'd never met before, and those people are still my friends. And um, <clears throat> we had they had elected a, a couple Democrats, and we were looking for someone else, or they were looking for someone else to run, and we were looking and looking, and uh, finally I said, "Well, I'll run." And so that's kind of the way it happened. Then I had to go through the screening process because we were, we were all very much into good government and process. And uh, so I did that, and and they they designated me as their candidate for local government. And 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 then you know a couple of years later, there things had changed so much at the national level, and we were represented in the assembly uh, and the senate by uh, by all Republicans, and. There was, I, there was, there had been some redistricting, and I thought this might be an opportunity, and um, told my friends that I'd like to run for that assembly seat. So I did, and and uh, and uh, I was elected on the coattails of Brendan Byrne, by the way. <laughs> well, let's talk about Brendan Byrne. When did you first meet him? I met him in the 1973 campaign. I I can't I can't remember exactly the first time we met. Um, but I remember the first time we campaigned together was actually in the t in Union Township, was which was not in my district or the district that I later represented. But um, we were uh, campaigning in, in Union Township, and uh, and then subsequently, you know, lots of meetings and things. And then he came into my di into District 22 and um, campaigned for me. And um, I'm I'm convinced that was why I won. I mean, it was a great picture on the front page of the Courier News and less than a week before the election of, of Brandon Byrne and 
and uh, a great smiling picture of him and and showing his support for me and my, for my election to the assembly and um, that was that was the beginning of um, again another relationship that continues I you know still as many of us do still see uh, Governor Byrne um, several times a year well we've heard others describe him as not terribly personable in that first uh, 1973 campaign what was he like as a sort of street campaigner with you I thought he was terrific he was very warm he was very personable he was outgoing I I never I never saw that side of him that people would talk about that he wasn't very personable I, I you know I think that maybe some people thought his his speaking his public speaking skills were were not as polished as they later became but I I never found it to be that to be a problem or or much of an issue and certainly I found him very personable with my family he was always very very uh, uh, warm and friendly to my family my children my husband and uh, uh, and and to the public he was very warm I thought now going back a little bit uh, during the primary election in that year did you have a candidate I did uh, Ann Klein was my candidate that year and uh, uh, there were a lot of us who were hoping very much that she was going to be the Democratic nominee uh, but she wasn't she was she didn't win and um, uh, because Ann was the person she was she made known to everybody that she she was going to be supporting Brendan Byrne and she knew that we would all do the same thing and of course we did how active were you in her primary campaign I wasn't that active I was uh, 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 on the township committee in Berkeley Heights at that time and teaching school and so I was plenty busy with those responsibilities so um, and in addition to having a family and uh, so uh, I wasn't I wouldn't I wasn't somebody who was out running around in her campaign a lot but uh, some of my friends uh, were running her campaign and so I was certainly knowledgeable about what she was doing mm -hmm. you, you that, I'm sorry no I was just gonna say that's I mean that's when I first met her too mm -hmm. through other people who were running her campaign do you remember any discussion among your friends who were act, more active in her campaign about whether uh, they should sort of fold their tents and back Brendan Byrne as a more electable candidate or were most of the people just committed to her oh people candidates? were just committed to her I mean this is a bunch of purists <laughs> <laughs> these are all folks who were very committed to her um, and uh, uh, you know people were aware that uh, uh, there were there were the Brendan Byrne was was commanding a wider base of support but um, until she was ready to pack it in nobody else was going to now uh, when you ran for the assembly um, what positions did you take on the major issues at that time as a teacher how about on education well I managed to antagonize the NJEA because I refused to support some things that they wanted me to, to support I, uh, I I didn't oppose them either I just said I, I have too much of an interest here as a teacher so I have to recuse myself and they thought that was outrageous but that was how I felt about it I didn't didn't think that I should participate um, in terms of the, the the big issue of the time the income tax uh, I was supporting the income tax during the 73 campaign um, I was I, and I remember a conversation somewhere going from place to place in the backseat of a car with Brandon Byrne when I he was pretty close to his election and I t said to him I think you really need to come out for the income tax I mean there I was just a candidate for the assembly telling this man who's candidate for governor but I did and um, uh, he listened he didn't didn't make any commitment but he did listen but um, so I was I knew the state needed I mean I believed that the state needed an income tax and so I was in support of the income tax and I supported the um, the bond issue the the, uh, the big bond issue that was 900 million dollars which was a huge mass uh, transit bond issue and uh, but also was supporting a group of people who wanted to get more mass transit money into it um, still it would have been a most of it would have been highway money but we were trying to get more uh, mass transit money into it so um, that that um, 
didn't go down too well with the uh, with the labor unions who really wanted highway money for construction because, you know, the the 70s it was it was a recession and people mm. were people were worried. And talk a little bit about the politics in the district that you ran in and the uh, other candidates in, for the assembly uh, in sure. 1973. Um, I was. Um, th this was an, a Republican district, and and had had always been a Republican district. And, but I, you know, I thought there was a chance, as I said, and, um, but it was a, it was a pre Republican district that afterward returned to its natural leanings and has continued, although there have been various redistricting, but has continued pretty much the same way uh, as a Republican district. <clears throat> it was, uh, my running mate and I, uh, I was told later by one of the aides to our county chairman that we really weren't expected to win uh, I, because my running mate, I don't know if you remember this, but he was indicted while we were in office, while we were in the assembly for something he had done previously when he had been public works director for the city of Rahway. And I spoke to one of the county chairman's uh, aides and said, why in the world did you ever let him run? He said, well, you two guys weren't supposed to win. <laughs> so. So that's the way it was. They didn't expect us to win, and um, and there was every reason to believe that that would stay Republican, I guess. But because of the year that it was, and the the national climate, and um, because of Brendan Burns' strength as a candidate, uh, we did win. When you won, did you think, well, this is going to be a one-term uh, incumbency because of the history of that district? I suppose if I had been wiser, I would have, but no, I was full of myself. I thought I won. I'm an assemblywoman, and, and I expected to be there for uh, a while. And so it was a rude awakening when I lost, when I ran for re-election two years later. Um, I don't know that anybody ever looks at themselves and says, well, I'm just going to be here for two years, and then I'll lose. Uh, I just, I mean, I couldn't imagine that I would ever, that, that thought would ever have passed over my mind. But looking back on it now, I can see that it was probably in the cards. Now that you are elected, what sort of lifestyle changes did you have to make in terms of family and uh, work and so forth in serving in the state legislature? Well, I was still a public school teacher. Uh, there was a state law that required that the school district um, allow me time away from my teaching job to serve in the assembly and uh, but it was it was very demanding to be running really two full-time jobs because I had an office at that time most state legislators did not have offices but I followed the incline model from when she had been an assemblywoman and decided to open an office in fact made a commitment during the campaign to use my legislative salary to support an office because there was no legislative appropriation at that time for for legislators' offices. So I that's what I did. I, I opened a small office in Scotch Plains and um, hired a few people at virtually, you know, at very small salaries. What was the legislative salary at that time? Legislative salary was $10,000 a year, and I got an extra, I think... 11, I think I got an elect, extra 1500 because I was in, in the leadership. I was, um, uh, it was the majority whip. And uh, so with that <coughs> amount of money, less the taxes that were taken out, I paid, I paid three people, I paid three and a half people out of that little bit of money. So you know nobody was making any money. And um, so it, it, was, it was a stretch everywhere. But everybody who worked with me was very committed to good government and to uh, reform and to environmental protection and to all the things that you know we had believed in that we had campaigned in for and that we had abdicated as as citizens and and so and members of our various organizations so <clears throat> it was we looked upon it as a great opportunity to to make change and to be uh, part of a, a process of change it just came a little came to an end too quickly for us to to do all the things we wanted to do. But uh, in terms of the family, it was and, and my job as a teacher, um, it was it was very hard. Uh, my uh, my oldest son had gone off to college, so 
he was um, really not affected all that much. My youngest son was in high school. And um, he was very proud of me. He thought it was great. And, and to this day, he says he doesn't, you know, when I say to him, I'm, I'm really sorry that I was away from the family so much, he says, he, oh, he reassures me that was no sacrifice, that he thought it was a great thing what I was doing. But um, at the job, it, it was a mixed bag with the job. And the positive side of it was I used to bring, I taught uh, government, I taught history. And um, I would bring students to Trenton and really give them a first-hand look at how things were done. I think that was a positive for my students. Uh, I had my school district arranged for a regular substitute. But, you know, it was, it was uh, uneven, I would have to say. Because you were coming down to Trenton at least twice a week. I was, yes. And, and we, were, we were coming down to Trenton at least twice a week and, and working very, very hard. So, and because I was in leadership, there would be extra meetings. So it was, uh, I, was, I was taken away from my, uh, from my job a lot. My school district was supportive. Uh, the law required that, but they were, they were very supportive and they uh, made whatever accommodations they had to make. But it was, it was, a, it was an unusual situation. Well, let's talk a bit about your election uh, to the leadership as majority whip. That's very unusual as a freshman, as a woman, uh, and also to a position like majority whip where your job basically is to get the votes, count the votes, talk to people who are much more senior in terms of legislative service than you as an incoming freshman legislator. Well, you're so right, Don. <laughs> it was uh, when I was asked if I wanted to do this, and I, it wasn't something I sought. I was really hoping I would get to be a committee chair. And uh, I, mean, I had no lack of nerve for a freshman. But uh, uh, when I was asked if I wanted to do this, and I think it was really the governor, Governor Byrne, who, who advocated this uh, appointment, this election. Uh, I said, well, I don't know. I have to think about it. And I called my, my then friend, Ann Klein, and I said, is this a real job or is this just a title? And she said, well, you know, it can be a real job if you make it a real job. So I said, I, I, I accepted it with, um, and, and made it into something real. Uh, but you're absolutely right. I mean, counting votes among people who are very senior, who really didn't want to support whatever you were counting the votes on a good part of the time, was um, often the reason for people to brush me off ever so rudely. Um, the, and and an, another complication of that was, you remember, we had a huge, we had a huge, we had 66 Democrats. So we had a huge majority. So there would be people who would not want to support whatever it was, the, you know, whatever the, we were trying to push at a particular time, that people would say, well, you know, I'll be number 41, but you really needed to get number 36, 37, 38. You could get, as Gordon McGinnis used to say, you can get the 32 Goo Goos. You can always get them. But getting from there to 41 was hard, and and because there were so there was such an ab abundance of Democrats, uh, a lot of people felt as if, well, you don't need me, you can get somebody else. So that was a that was always a challenge. Did you sense any resentment among the other leaders, particularly since, as you've said, you think Brendan Byrne pushed you, uh, or pushed your election to the leadership on them? I don't think so. Uh, Howard Woodson, Reverend Woodson, was the speaker, and he was he was wonderful. He was, and Joe Lafonte was the majority leader, and they were they were. I never felt any resentment. Uh, we developed a wonderful working relationship, and uh, there was a lot of camaraderie among the leadership, and I I did not feel that ever. We talked generally about the job of majority whip, but. In nuts and bolts terms, what did you actually do? Well, I had the list. And we would sit in our leadership meetings and we would say, okay, who do we have? And we'd go down the list. We'd know who we had on a particular bill. We were counting votes on, on bills all the time. Who do we have? Okay, who do we think we can get? 
And then once we thought who we could get, who should go talk to this one, who should talk to that one, who should go up to the speaker's office, you know, and that's just it was it was that kind of uh, kind of rudimentary work that we had to do on bill after bill after bill. As a woman, did you sense from any of your Democratic colleagues uh, resentment to your role in getting them to commit on a bill or not commit? Well, I did. I don't think it was necessarily as a woman. Maybe it was because I was a freshman. Maybe it was because I was a woman. Maybe it was just because I didn't want to do it. Um, but there was, there was some resentment, and and you know there were people who who wouldn't vote for you know whatever it was, and sometimes we'd. Uh, uh, ask people to go to see the governor, and he would talk to them. Um, but in terms of, of their feelings toward me, I really have to say it was less uh, toward me as a woman and more toward their not wanting to do that particular thing at that particular time for their own political reasons. I assume that you learned as you did this job uh, strategies that would work and would not work. Uh, talk about that. I mean, did you sort of adjust your way of uh, contacting and communicating with uh, the other assembly people? Well, I think I did. I think I learned more about figuring out who should talk to somebody and that there were certain people who would listen to other people, but they wouldn't listen to me. So that was a matter of just testing the waters with people. And uh, there were two whips. Um, uh, Ken Gortz was the other whip. He had a completely different way of working. I have no idea what he did. I, quite honestly, I have no. Well, well he, he was a very colorful character Indeed in New Jersey was. political <laughs> history. Why don't you describe him a little bit from, <laughs> from your own biased perspective? <laughs> well, he was, he was flamboyant. He would not necessarily go along with the governor's program, even though he was in the leadership. He, was, um, he dressed in a very flashy way. He, um, he subsequently had some... Uh, Publicity, some of it not so pleasant. His, his Atlantic City. <laughs> his Atlantic City escapades, yes. With uh, a couple of prostitutes. <laughs> I saw him last year, and he's still very much the same guy. You know, a little bit more mellow with age. Okay. Well, we'll ha let someone else tell the gory details of that story. <laughs> Uh, what about the personalities of the others that you dealt with uh, on a frequent basis? You've mentioned Reverend Woodson, who was the first African-American um, speaker of the assembly. What about the others like Joe LaFonte and other uh, significant people? Joe LaFonte was a, was a great guy, and I never met him before I was elected. He, he accepted me and embraced me as a member of, of his team was always a gentleman, and um, you know, he was from the, uh, he was from Bayonne, he was from, you know, the rough and tumble politics of Hudson County, which I had had some peripheral experience with because I, I lived in Jersey City, and I went to uh, what was then Jersey City State College, now it's New Jersey City University, and graduated from there, um, and as a, as a senior project, had uh, worked on some of the nuts and bolts political stuff in my legisl in my uh, election district. So I had a, a little familiarity, and you couldn't live in Hudson County for 10 years and not know some of the history up there. So I had some idea of it, but not, not ever any real experience in the way that somebody who came up through that system would have. So he was, you know, he was a person with experience that, that I never had and uh, that I felt I could learn a lot from. He was... He, he was uh, very much a, a kind of rough around the edges guy, but always a, a gentleman, and always uh, I learned a lot from him about sticking to your guns and and uh, taking you know taking some hard knocks and getting back up and going back at it. You know, we passed the income tax, and then the Senate didn't even vote on it, so the whole whole lot of us in the leadership really felt smacked down after that one. But we pulled ourselves back up. Any other people you'd like to sort of reminisce about? Well, uh, Bill Hamilton was the assistant majority leader when I was the, uh, uh, in the leadership. And uh, I had met Bill during my campaign. I came down here to New Brunswick one day and had lunch with him at the Rutgers Club and tried to get to know him a little bit and get advice from him on, on running. And uh, again, always found him to be a gentleman and, and a good mentor. Mm -hmm. um, now let's talk about the issues as Brendan Byrne 
uh, takes office. This is inaugurated in January in 1974. Uh, initially, uh, what were the things that you found most important to get done? Well, uh, I thought the income tax was exceedingly important. Uh, public financing of campaigns, um, the Open Public Meetings Act, and um, I think that, I mean, the whole issue, Watergate was was cooking in Washington, so the whole uh, uh, environment of ethics and government was exceedingly important. Of course, it was very important in his campaign. He was, he was uh, dubbed the man who couldn't be bought, and that was a, 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 a huge... Uh, issue the whole issue of, of corruption was a huge issue and and that played in his favor um, so the I would say clean government there were I mean there were a ton of issues there were the environmental issues in my district we had tremendous flooding problems on the Green Brook which 40 years later they're still having because nothing has ever really been done about it but there were there were uh, important environmental issues uh, that needed to be addressed as well of course, it took a while after the governor's inauguration for him to come out squarely for the income tax. Right, right. Talk about the sort of process and what role uh, you had in sort of arguing one way or, or the other in terms of supporting the tax or not. Well, he knew I supported it, so uh, uh, I, was, I wouldn't say that I had a role in persuading him. I think the persuasion came from his own treasurer and his own um, his own team uh, in his administration when they saw the handwriting on the wall and saw what they were you know what they had to deal with so uh, I wouldn't take any credit for that he certainly knew from day one that he had a supporter where I was concerned and and that was uh, he valued that how about among the other leaders in the assembly were there people saying Politically, this is not the way we should go. Sure, uh, there were. Um, you know, Speaker Woodson got on board with it. I think uh, Joe Lafonte was uncomfortable with it, but he was the majority leader, and he was going to do his job as majority leader, which he understood to be to push the governor's program. Um, and um, uh, and Bill Hamilton was supportive. Uh, I mean, you know, I think that our leadership was okay. Uh, in terms of, I mean, I think we, we all, in our own, each in his own way, uh, understood that the income tax was necessary, and this is now the governor's program, so we're going to, we're going to do everything we can to get it through. Dealing with the Democratic caucus was something not to be believed. I mean, people were all over the map in the Democratic caucus, and everybody had their concerns, and, and, uh, uh, I grew very accustomed to hearing, but I can't support this in my district. I will never get reelected. This is what people would say. And uh, as a testament to my naivete, I couldn't believe that that would be the motivator for somebody <laughs> not to vote for something if it was the right thing. But, of course, that says more about me than it does about them. Uh, but people were, people were just... Just never. I mean, there were many people who just never wanted to get on board with it, and some never did. Within the Democratic caucus, who were the most uh, outspoken opponents to opponents? the opponents? Opponents. Well, isn't it interesting? I can't remember. Mm. I I can see a sea of faces, and all angry and mad at us mm. <laughs> for even bringing it up. Well, of course, you had, well, as, you, as you've mentioned, several assembly people who had been elected in traditionally Republican districts like yours, yes. and also some from South Jersey who were inherently conservative given their constituencies. Was that basically it? Was it the regional mix that South Jersey was more, more conservative and these swing districts were worried about their re-election? Well, you know, it re really is, is, I think, true that the people from the swing districts were not the ones who were opposing. I mean, I think about Gordon McGinnis, who was certainly from a swing district up in Morris County. Uh, he supported it. Now, Rosemary Totaro did not. I mean, she was also from a swing district from Morris County, and she didn't support it. There were, um, I can't think of any Republicans that supported it. And... And there were some. There were very strong opponents from South Jersey. Uh, Kenny Gortz didn't support it. 
and he was in the leadership, but he didn't care. He he didn't support it. Um, so I think it was it, it to some extent it was it was the regional mix. I mean, it was the regional mix south north, and to some extent it was the um, the swing districts. Well, describe more the the process where the assembly does finally take up the tax and pass it. Uh, was the assumption then that the Senate uh, either had the votes or that at least would uh, vote on the bill that you had um, had passed? Uh, the assumption was that the Senate was going to vote on it and that they had the votes. Um, and when t I don't, I, there was such a breakdown between the Senate Democratic leadership and the Assembly Democratic leadership, it far surpassed any divide between Republicans and Democrats. There was, there was hardly a spoken word for a while between the two leaderships. Um, I guess that would have to be after the Senate decided not to take it up. But beforehand, we never would have put it on our, our agenda if we didn't believe that the Senate would do it. Now, maybe we made an error in judgment. Uh, maybe we were given assurances that we that were, were then not fulfilled. Um, maybe somebody, maybe the people from the governor's office were, were confident when maybe their confidence was misplaced. I don't know. I don't know. We, uh, it was a very hard vote in, this, in the assembly. That was that summer when it was so hot. It, we didn't have any air conditioning in the state house, and we were there till late at night, and it went on and on and on and on and on. And... Uh, but we passed it, and we did. Yes, we did believe the Senate was going to vote on it, and that they had the votes. And then they walked away from it. So we were kind of hung out to dry. Mm -hmm. So I assume there was quite a bit of resentment among the assembly people who had sort of stepped up to the plate, and uh, as a result of the Senate's inaction. Uh, you would be correct in making that <laughs> assumption. <laughs> okay. Well, what happens next? Well, what happens next? We went back to well. I think we took a break, as I as I recall. It's it's a long time ago, but as I recall, uh, we took a break and uh, came back and took up the rest of our business and uh, continued, frankly, until the end. I mean, then the next year was the election, and and until the end of my term, continued to try to get the Senate to take up the income tax, which was just an effort in futility. Hmm. They just weren't going to do it. Let's backtrack a little bit. Some of the people we've spoken to have suggested that the governor's staff and governor's cabinet wasn't particularly helpful during this tax debate back and forth that some people in the legislature perceived at least one or two of them as arrogant or as not uh, people that they really wanted to deal with. How did you view that? Well, I know people felt that way about some uh, of the governors, uh, 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 some of the people in the administration. Uh, I think that um, I, I never had that feeling. I never, but of course, I was supporting the governor's program, so uh, the issues wouldn't have been quite the same for me. But um, I found the governor's people very helpful. Uh, they provided me great. They provided great materials to us to take take around and do do dog and pony shows in our districts, so we could explain this to people. And uh, we were of the belief that if people just understood it, they would support it. Um, but so I had great materials and great help and great support from them. But I do know that some people did feel that it wasn't quite business as usual in. They couldn't horse trade the way they perhaps in the past had or they thought it had happened in the past and they wanted it to happen now that, in, that there would be some reward to them for their vote or some sort of recognition or something. And that wasn't always forthcoming. And, um, and so there was, there was some resentment there toward, toward uh, one or two people in the governor's, in the governor's office. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know if it, any of that. I mean, I think that's how some people felt. Mm -hmm. Now, 
after the tax fails in that first year, uh, did you think it was going to get restarted again during your first term? I did, but I think that was probably foolish to even entertain those thoughts. Mm -hmm. But I did. I thought we would uh, we would be able to resurrect it, and uh, but not so. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about some of the other issues you dealt with. Uh, you mentioned open public meetings, uh, gu uh, gubernatorial finance. Uh, talk a little bit about your memories of those uh, issues. Well, public financing of gubernatorial campaigns was a big issue and uh, uh, a way to, to make steps forward in uh, 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 reducing the role of, of, of in, uh, private influences in government, inappropriate private influences in government. Um, and, uh, and, and Brandon Byrne came out very quickly. As I remember, he, his, he issued an executive order very early on, um, requiring certain ethical reports. I don't remember anymore what they were. Um, and But one of the first bills that he pushed was public financing of the gubernatorial campaigns. And, and the climate was right because it was, you know, it, it was 1973, or excuse me, 74. And um, it was coming to to the end of, uh, of Richard Nixon's time. So people were, were ready for this, this kind of uh, what was seen as, as really a major overhaul of the way uh, gubernatorial campaigns were, were paid for. And before, I mean, in, um, in the Cahill administration, there had been a number of high-level indictments, which also fed into the public's support for this notion of public financing. What other issues do you recall? I remember the uh, citizens' right to sue for uh, environmental um, in environmental cases. I remember the um, um, hmm. help me out here. Mm. <laughs> How about in transportation? What were the major things on the plate at that point? Well, in transportation. Um, The, the, the um, Transportation Department uh, developed this, uh, I think it was $900 million transportation bond issue. And the, um, and most, I think it was, I can't remember, but it was, we'll say 600 million highways and 300 million tr transit, something like that. Or, or the breakdown might have been a little bit different than that. And uh, so there was an effort on the part of those of us who were advocates of mass transit to get more mass transit money in there, not to make it smaller and not to make the uh, highway fund less than the mass transit. But um, the labor unions were very, very powerful and they, they fought that tooth and nail, even though, you know, building mass transit would also create jobs, which was their interest because the uh, they, were, they were focused on the highway construction. They were, they were vehement. And what happened was it went on the ballot and it was defeated. It was just, the public just thought it was too much money, period. So that's another one that I, that I remember well. The, um, you know, there were hundreds of bills we voted on and it's hard to remember any no, of them. <laughs> that's okay. Now, after we get past 1974, uh, do you start thinking about your own political prospects and planning for re-election? Yes, I did. Um, um, I, I fully intended and did run for re-election, but my running mate was now in jail, so his seat was empty. They didn't have a special election for that. I, something, I don't remember why, but there was not a special election. So there was concern about finding a running mate and also who was going to run for the Senate seat in my district. Now, the senator at that time was Pete McDonough, very popular Republican, and uh, I decided I didn't want to challenge him. So I stayed where I was in the uh, assembly seat, thinking I was going to be reelected. And uh, uh, there was a there were there were various names suggested. Some, at least one of which I can think of, uh, would probably have been uh, a good choice, but it didn't work out. So the fellow who ran with me was a. a a well-known labor guy, very nice man, um, Bill Wolf, 
and um, his his uh, you know he, we ran together. Uh, I think that we ran together, but we ran separately, mm-hmm. and we ran two separate campaigns, and then we ran a joint campaign, and um, had every <laughs> expectation we would win. But we had a. Uh, um, Bill Wright was our Senate candidate, a, an African American from Plainfield. So we had a good ticket. We had, you know, an African American man, woman, labor guy. So it was a good ticket. But by then it was 1975, and the and and the Republicans put up a very good slate against us. Don De Francesca was on that slate. Um, I can't remember who the other people were, but Don De Francesca, of course, had major stay, staying power for decades after that and that ticket won he was he was just I knew him he was a young lawyer and um, uh, he was had when I was on the Berkeley Heights Township Committee he was um, his firm represented us up there and um, and he was a good candidate and many 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 years later after he and I were well after I was out of the legislature he was still in the legislature I happened to be at a conference with Don and his wife and uh, we were chatting about the election in 1975, and and she's, they both said to me, you know, you didn't have a chance because Don's father sponsored every Italian in Scotch Plains, so of course they were going to vote for him. And they, Don and his supporters at one point thought of trying to suggest to people that they vote, they split their ticket, that they vote for Don and for me, but they thought that would just be too confusing for people and it would cost them the election, so they did not. But, um, you know. What were the major issues in that campaign? Um, The income tax. The Equal Rights Amendment, you'll recall that was on the ballot. Um, Eldridge Hawkins from Essex County had, had sponsored that bill, and I had privately asked him not to do it at that time, that we had enough to deal with in the election of 75, could he hold off? He said, I'll only hold back if you will give me a letter asking me to do that. And I said, well, I can't do that because, you know, then it would reflect badly on me. I'm not asking you not to support it. I'm asking you to wait. But he wouldn't wait. So he pushed his ERA amendment uh, through the legislature, and it was on the ballot. It was very controversial. So there was uh, the income tax. There was the ERA. I had been an advocate for uh, abortion rights. So there was that. There was the transportation bond issue. I mean, I looked back on it and I thought, I managed to antagonize just about every constituency that I had in my district with all of these, this array of issues that um, were then there that I had to deal with in my re-election effort. And of course, uh, Brendan Burns' popularity had uh, plummeted uh, significantly at this point also. That's correct. Uh, Some people said you shouldn't bring him in to campaign for you. Uh, He did come in to campaign for me because I I believed that 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 would be helpful. And uh, uh, he was, you know, he was willing to help anybody who would help him, but he also was aware or anybody whom he could help, but he was also aware that because of the income tax primarily, he, uh, his popularity was, uh, was uh, sinking. So you lose the election. What did you think then? Go back to full-time teaching, or did you uh, see other opportunities? Um, I got a call the next day from uh, Governor Byrne, who said immediately, I'd like you to come into my administration. And... Um, so I went and talked to him. I did go back to school. I, get, I took a few weeks off and got some rest, and I went back to teaching and, and realized that uh, that wasn't where I wanted to be anymore. And uh, so I, he and I talked several times, and, and um, he asked me what I was interested in. And uh, David Bardeen, who was Commissioner of Environmental Protection at that time, reached out for me and said he'd like me to come in and talk to him. And, and uh, we reached agreement that I would come to... To uh, I would go to work for him as an assistant commissioner at that time. Why don't you describe David Bardeen's uh, personality <laughs> and work work uh, style? Well, he was a workaholic. He was probably the smartest person I ever worked for. He was brilliant. He was 
exceedingly difficult for people. And I, I learned quickly that you had, to, you had to give him something to push up against and go back when he would get into his, his um, tirades. The way, to, the way to shut it down was to yell back at him or to push back in some way. Um, he was difficult, but I didn't have difficulty with him because I figured that out pretty early on. And maybe he was not as hard on me as he was on some other people. Uh, I think he was probably really hard on some people who just didn't have, I mean, you know, I had a, I had a relationship with the governor that certainly he knew about. And I think that strengthened my standing in the department and my standing with, with David. I mean, I, I, thought he was, I thought he was brilliant. I learned a tremendous amount from him. And he was difficult. What were your responsibilities within the department? I started as um, assistant commissioner for regional projects, which was a new position that he created. He did away with some, he had done away with some positions, and he, this was something he so I was responsible for flood control, for um, open space grid the Green Acres program, and um, any other oh, any other regional project that anything that could be defined as a regional project that came along, and of course the Pinelands was perking up at that time, Pinelands Preservation, and so that fell right into my, um, my area of responsibility. And then after about a oh, year and something, um, he, he, David Bardeen left. I mean, he left less than a year and a half after I came there, and um, he went to Washington, and Rocco Ricky became the commissioner, and, um, and then I, he made me deputy commissioner. And... And then I have department-wide responsibilities, but I continued to focus on the um, the natural resources and the open space and green acres and um, regional projects and and the pinelands. And by that time, we were we were really up to up to our elbows in in work on the pinelands preservation. That was a by when the governor was reelected in 1977. Um, he considered, he made it known to us that he considered that he had a mandate for Pinelands Preservation because he had talked about it in his campaign and he had won um, in, in the states that were, in the uh, counties that were affected. Another priority during that first term was Liberty State Park. Talk about that a little bit. Oh, yeah. Thank you for reminding me of that. Um, yeah, I was, um, that was another of my areas of responsibilities that, and we did bring Liberty State Park online in, on June 14, 1976, which was my first year in the department. We had a 14-acre slice that we opened that year. And uh, uh, the project had been under, was underway for, before I got there. And uh, they had gotten some Corps of Engineers money <clears throat> to, um, it was harbor, harbor cleanup money, to clear out the uh, hundreds of sunken vessels around the perimeter and to secure the perimeter. The site was just an unbelievable mess, as you'll, you'll remember, I know. And, um, and the, you know, we, uh, we had the Gettys firm do the plan for the park. And it was, it was staged. And the first stage was the uh, 14 acres on the southern end. And that 14 acres was the most, it seems to me, it was the most visited par, state park in the, in the whole system. Uh, when the first year it opened, it was, it was there was so much pent up demand there for that kind of access to the water. We we uh, were still dealing with the industrial and railroad control of the waterfronts all around the state, except for the ocean, and uh, uh, so it was it was just wonderful for people to be able to to get to the to the water and. Uh, People just it was people just loved it, and then we we phased in the the northern end and they cleaned out the Morris Canal that was you know there were all these people living on houseboats up there, and and a million dogs living on the site and um, you remember Jerry McCabe who was our he was the project manager who um, uh, really really shepherded that project through um, to completion. Who was a retired Air Force colonel, and I didn't realize until I read his obituary of what a war hero he was. 
Yes. I didn't know Jerry had died. Yes. Oh. Yes, we Colonel McCabe and and Colonel Mc, now, now there there was a guy who didn't know what to call me. He would come in and he would he would sir everybody, and he would say he, sir to no no he'd say what do I call you what do I say? <laughs> I say how about my name? <laughs> yes, he was he was very he was very much the military man and very proper and very correct, and uh, uh, started you know started out calling me sir. We had a we had a great working relationship, and he was great with with uh, David Bardeen. Now, uh, as you go further into your tenure at the Department of Environmental Protection, Brendan Byrne is still very low in popularity in the polls, and is thinking about running for re-election. What was your own personal view on that? Well, I thought I thought it was a huge risk for him to run again, but. On the other hand, when he decided to do it, I mean, I wasn't one of the people who was advising him at that time, uh, but if he wants to do it, I will certainly support him all the way. I mean, frankly, what happened there when I was appointed to the DEP job, there was a, lot of con there was a bit of controversy about my getting this job. The defeated assemblywoman gets a job in state government. It was called a plum. And... Uh, so my name was in the paper all too much in, in those days, and I felt very concerned that I was damaging the governor. He never once gave me any indication that he would, would withdraw his support from me, never. And uh, so certainly when he wanted support to run for re-election, I was absolutely going to support him. There were a lot of people who were running that year. There were, what was it, nine or something in that primary. And uh, I did a lot of surrogate speaking for Governor Byrne. And uh, uh, I think that, uh, you know, that was a tough time for him. It was a tough time for everybody. But, but um, you know, I, I, did, I did an event for him, a, a women's event for him, and did everything that I felt I could and did everything I could to keep my name out of the paper because <laughs> I did not want to be a liability to him. Uh, who were the other, sort of other key people that you think uh, were advising at that point about whether or not to run for re-election? Well, certainly John Dagnan. Um, I'm sure Jerry English. Uh, Dick Coffey. Um, I'm sure there were legislators who he turned to. Uh, like Reverend Woodson, I would think, would be someone he would consult. Um, I'm just guessing here, but that's who I would think that he was... You'd probably know better than I do. <laughs> when uh, you mentioned that you, you had some mixed feelings about whether he really should run, was that because of your own experience and sort of being hurt when you were defeated? Well, it was really a terrible experience to be defeated. I mean, I couldn't talk about it for a year. I just, I couldn't talk about it and uh, for a year and, and, and then some probably. Uh, so certainly there was, I, you know, I didn't want him to be hurt. I didn't want him to be humiliated. And, um, and I thought he, you know, I, I certainly thought he didn't deserve that. Um, so, and the, the polls were terrible. I don't remember exactly what the lowest number was, but I, I mean, I know it was, it was bad. And um, um, I, I thought it was unfair. I thought it was unjust, but nevertheless, I... I uh, I thought that I was I was concerned I was concerned for him yeah. Uh, what other groups apart from the women's organizations did they send you out to uh, speak to in his behalf? You know I remember sitting there with um, Joe Hoffman, Paul Jordan. Um, did Jim Florio run that time? Yes. Jim Florio. I'm, you know, a right across this, but I think it was probably Democratic clubs. I don't really remember what groups it was, other than women's groups. Maybe some, maybe some gatherings of environmentalists. Although I don't really know that. Mm -hmm. Now, were you surprised when he won the primary election? No, because I had gotten the feeling. Uh, I remember Paul Jordan said to me something very encouraging when I uh, was a surrogate for uh, 
Governor Byrne at one at one event. I don't remember where, but uh, he had said something very encouraging to me that from his perspective, as one of the others, that the vote was going to be split up so many ways that the governor was probably going to win the primary. Mm -hmm. Were you there on election night at the headquarters? Yeah, I was, yeah. What was the mood? Well, as I recall, it was relief. Mm -hmm. uh, I think pretty much relief and jubilation. Maybe some surprise. <laughs> Do you remember speaking to him that night? Or? I remember standing behind him when he gave his acceptance speech. There were a crowd of us on the platform. and But I don't remember that I had any personal words with him that night. Now, in the general election, he's also a heavy underdog at the start of the campaign. Uh, what was your feeling? Was this winnable or not? Well, I was the eternal optimist. I always thought we could win. <laughs> so sure, I thought we could win. Um, and he, you know, as it, as it went on, it became more and more evident, uh, the, 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 whole, the whole debate between himself and, and uh, Ray Bateman about the income tax and and you know his posing the question well what's your plan and Bateman's plan was just silly and, and it wasn't a plan and from that point on it seemed as if the uh, editorial opinion and uh, uh, public opinion as far as I could tell uh, began to really move in his favor now, on election night in November, uh, what was your mood and what was the mood of the people you were with? Well, that was, that was, I guess, joy, jubilation, uh, some level of, more level of relief, and, uh, uh, and also very happy for him that, that he had been, in my opinion, he was vindicated by that vote. And the, the, the things that he had done, the political courage that he had demonstrated had been rewarded and he had been vindicated. In retrospect, do you think there is a different strategy that Ray Bateman could have adopted in that campaign that would have made a difference for him? Well, you know what, I think, I think Ray Bateman was in a losing position because the income tax was the only answer to the problem. And as long as he was not going to say yes to the income tax, he didn't really have anywhere to go. So I don't, and the, the issue was bringing the public around to understanding that. And so I, I don't see anything that he could have done differently. I'm sure he's probably got, and people who were affiliated with him would have some ideas, but from my perspective, I don't. I don't think he had. I don't. I don't think he made. He could. There was anything he could have done to make the difference, except that if he could have continued to obfuscate and uh, and scare the public, which I guess a tribute to him as a decent man that he didn't do that. Did you have any other dealings with Ray Bateman in the department or in the legislature? Uh, no, I didn't, but uh, later, uh, a good deal later, probably um, seven or eight years later, uh, he was an investor in a, a business that I was in, but n not at that time. Okay. Uh, as um, Brendan Byrne gets organized for his second term, what are your thoughts personally about whether you stay in government or look for something else or just go home? Well, just going home wasn't an option, but um, um, no, I definitely uh, uh, wanted to stay. Um, I would have been happy to have been named commissioner of the Department of Environmental Protection, but that didn't happen. But I was very happy with the choices that he made and uh, uh, worked for some uh, extraordinary people. Of course, Jerry English is named commissioner. Well, let me see. It was... Uh, when was Dan? Oh, I'm sorry. Dan, Dan O'Hearn. Dan O'Hearn was the first after the election. 
And I didn't know Dan, knew nothing about him uh, until he came there and just found him to be a prince of a man. He's just just a wonderful man and a human being and a, a, a leader I was happy to work with. And he was so he was he so valued the people who worked with him, and uh, and worked for him, and and I, I liked him a lot. And uh, and then after Dan went to become chief counsel, that's when I think Jerry came. Yeah, and uh, and I worked for her for a year. And of course I knew Jerry from Union County days, so that was a a familiar relationship. Did your responsibilities change under either Dan O'Hearn or Jerry? Well, under Dan, I would say that my responsibilities expanded, if anything. He really looked to me to, um, to, to, to assist him, to advise him, to, to um, bring him up to speed. And, and uh, so it, it, certainly my, my responsibilities expanded. Um, with Jerry, I would not say that that was the same. I mean, my responsibilities changed a little bit. But I still had my same line responsibilities. I mean, I was I was by that time kind of the old timer in the, at the at that level in the department, and so I was the one who knew the people and who knew where some of the bodies were, and and who knew the how things were done and what the what the ropes were in that department. So um, that my, those line responsibilities did not change because of her own priorities. Some of my some of my um, uh, external responsibilities changed, and um, but I wouldn't say tremendously. Why don't we talk about the Pinelands, which is your principal uh, responsibility today? Uh, you mentioned that Brendan Byrne told you and the others in the department that he thought he had a mandate as a result of his reelection to pursue his program in the Pinelands. That probably was stretching it somewhat. <laughs> I mean, I believe most of the people in the governor's office felt the Pinelands politically was not something that he should pursue. What was the attitude within the department? Oh, the department loved it. You know, that's where all the green folks are. And, uh, and they had actually been doing, even before I worked for David Bardeen, before I and at the very beginning of my tenure there, David Bardeen asked his regulatory staff to look for every regulation they could find that would help him to begin to implement some sort of program of, of preservation in the Pinelands. So they were, they were re uh, really ratcheting down on the regulations. Uh, there was also the, um, what was it called, the Pinelands Environmental Council, which mm -hmm. was David Bardeen has been quoted as saying they, they, they came up with a plan that was the land speculator's dream. So he challenged them. He was willing to, uh, to confront them. And there were public meetings that were people in the public down in the Pinelands were very, very hostile. And that was all going on leading up to, when, up to the 77 election while David Bardeen was still there. By the 77 election, he had left the department, and uh, so we already had the ground, some of the groundwork laid. And he, uh, a, there was a, a, um, a co committee appointed that uh, was to come up with a plan. I was on that. I represented the department. I was on the committee. Um, Craig Gates, Charlie's brother, uh, was was on that. There were about, and I brought somebody into the department to 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 staff. That effort, Sean Riley, you might remember, and um, brought Howard Wolf up from Green Acres to head up the, the acquisition because the acquisition of land in the Pinelands was going oh too slowly, and the governor really wanted us to accelerate the acquisition. So even before the act was, I mean, it was, it, it was in the planning, but even before that uh, surfaced, uh, we were taking a lot of steps to lay the groundwork for... Um, to, to do whatever we could do within existing powers. And um, uh, the plan that we produced was became then the found part of what was used to, to draft the, uh, the legislation. But uh, uh, we were working vigorously to buy land. And uh, Judy Askin was 
I think she was first assistant attorney general at that time. She knew the land tenure patterns in the Pinelands better than anybody I've ever talked to before or since. She knew who owned every little piece of land and what the history of it was. And, and the land tenure patterns were just, it was a tangle. It was a tangle of, which was part of why I guess maybe it was preserved because it was hard to, ownership was not clear of much of the land down there. And so anyway, we, we got, we got uh, put together a big push to buy land because the governor said, take, take the Green Acres money, set aside some amount of money, I forget, and start buying up land. And so we started, that was what we started to do as soon as the 77 election was over, we went, we went full steam ahead on, on, on all of that. And, and then, of course, the, uh, at the same time, the, the federal bill was being considered in Washington. And uh, uh, the governor sent me down to, to um, testify on his behalf before the committee. And um, I remember the chairman of the committee was Senator Matsunaga. Of, I think he was from Hawaii. And, um, and they were very, very cordial about it. And um, uh, so things things went from there. The the you know, as you know, the, f the federal law was passed, and then the then the state law. And at some point, the governor issues his executive order, essentially imposing a moratorium on granting of permits by the department and other departments for development in the Pinelands. Uh, and many people have thought that that executive order really stretched his powers under the state constitution uh, maybe to an unconstitutional point. Uh, do you recall the discussions as to whether he should or should not do this? I recall the discussions more of what are we going to do about it now that he's done it. Uh, I do remember that there were discussions leading up to it, should he do it. I think Dan O'Hearn was probably uh, closely involved with that. Uh, I was not. Um, but when he uh, signed the executive order, the federal law had been passed, but the state law had not. And um, Dan O'Hearn was, I think he was very, very concerned. And on a maybe a Thursday or a Friday afternoon, uh, seems to me it was toward the end of the week, he came back from the state house, called me into his office. He said, we have to do something so that this isn't overturned as being arbitrary and capricious. So over the weekend, we devised this appeal process. I mean, we didn't do regulations. We didn't do public hearings. We didn't get legislation. We just did it. It was one of the greatest, most fun things that we ever did in government when I was there. He, we, we, figured, we just set up an appeals process. We had um, Dick Inman from DCA. We had a representative from agriculture. And I, Sorry, I don't remember his name. We pulled up a couple of staff people, one from uh, Coastal Resources and uh, Bill Harrison from our Division of Water Resources. And we decided we would have, un uh, uh, we would somehow communicate to the public through the press, I presume we did, um, that there would, if, if they were aggrieved by, a dis by a, this moratorium, they could bring their an appeal to this body review body and the, the review body would hear the appeal and would decide yay or nay whether to grant relief or not and um, we met for at least six months uh, once a week hearing appeals uh, with these two staff people doing the preparation in between and of course from there Bill Harrison went on to work for the Pinelands Commission and became the author of the most of the regulations that are is still in place today. But that was the beginning uh, of it, and that was the relief mechanism that we put in place to hear appeals. And um, our record was, I think our record was pretty good. We granted relief to single family homes, and we pretty much turned down all the developers. Now, you mentioned Dan O'Hearn coming back from the State House and asking that over the weekend you and others in the department sort of develop this appeals process to avoid a legal challenge. Uh, did you have a feeling that Dan was 
very concerned about the overall legality as a lawyer and later as a Supreme Court justice? Well, I don't want to attribute to him, but yes, I do think he was concerned. I think he was, he was, he, did, he wanted to see that the governor had signed the order. He wanted to see it upheld, but he felt that something had to be done to, um, for, for there to be a relief valve. And so, I th yes, I think he was concerned. He was concerned enough to say we need to do this and we don't have time to do it by the normal process of regulations. Well, of course, the executive order does get challenged in court, uh, but as the uh, process is moving forward, also legislation mm -hmm. is being considered in the legislature. Uh, talk a little bit about that process. Did you go over and testify before committees or talk to individual legislators about the bill? Um, I talked a lot to a lot of individual legislators. I wasn't uh, the one who was testifying before committees, but uh, I did talk to a lot of legislators, and I know that there was a lot of concern. There was a lot of concern in, in among the South Jersey um, delegation, and um, we, you know, we tried to reassure people, we tried to convince people, we tried to deal with the facts as they were, and, um, but there was a lot of controversy. There was a great, and there was a great deal of animosity. It's amazing to me now, 27 years later, how much support we have from the local governments. The, the mayors of, from towns were, that were just up in arms about this, uh, now support the Pine Lands. So now, uh, mayors who were saying you're going to limit our ability to develop are now coming with us and pleading with us, please stop the development. We can't take anymore. So it's, it's been a real uh, transformation, uh, you know, a quarter of a century later. Well, we could talk about this a little bit later, but maybe this is a nice time to just give an overview of the Pinelands as a region and its environmental and other resources. Well, the Pinelands National Reserve is 1.1 million acres of New Jersey, which is over 20% of New Jersey. Um, I remember when I said that to Dan O'Hearn back in those days that we were just talking about, I said, you know, Dan, this is more than 20% of New Jersey. And he said, don't ever say that again. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't, <laughs> but uh, I do now. And um, uh, it is a, an area it's a, of, of unique natural resources. It's got a, a huge pure water supply, um, a, a water supply that would 17 trillion gallons. And what that translates into is 10 feet of water over the entire state of New Jersey. That's what's in the Kirkwood Cohansey Aquifer and the associated aquifers under the Pinelands. And uh, it's a, a natural, we have plants in the Pinelands that are not found anywhere else on the planet, three plants. We have a 10,000 acre pygmy forest that is the largest such uh, natural uh, forest anywhere in the, on the planet of its kind. It's, a, um, it's an area of, of uh, remarkable uh, natural features that deserve to be protected, and, and the state of New Jersey is is uh, is fortunate that there was foresight enough. Because without the Pinelands Protection Act and all the efforts that were made, uh, there would be rampant development in that area. Uh, there would be no doubt be an airport or something of its kind. And all of those natural features uh, would, would be lost. Betty, before we broke, uh, you had given us an overview of some of the Pinelands uh, special resources. Uh, there are some other uh, things that are very interesting about the Pinelands, uh, particularly its periodic fires that destroy the forest and then the forest regrows. Talk a little bit about that ecology. The, um Yes, the ecology of the Pinelands is, uh, depends on fire. So the forest requires fire to be renewed. And uh, so when there is a fire, there, it's not such a disaster for the forest. Now, having said that, it is a disaster if the fuel buildup has become so great that the fire gets terribly out of control. That's mostly because 
it begins to threaten homes that are in the peri we hope in the perimeter or within the forest. And so the fire, the, the ecology, the, the, the heat, the, the pine cones need heat in order to open and regenerate the trees. And we had a fire uh, just here a few weeks ago that burned close to 20,000 acres. And it, I, I've, I've gone down there and looked at it and it's, it's devastating. It looks terrible with just black charred trees. Uh, for mile after mile along Route 539 and back in the woods off of Route 72. But uh, th that will come back. They're, I have no doubt they're already beginning to regenerate. And so the forest, though it will take some time, will come back. But what is so of such great concern is uh, the development that has occurred at the, um, uh, at the forest urban interface. And uh, some of that development was there before the Pinelands Act was passed, uh, or at least it, the approvals had been given, and so they were grandfathered in. And um, and some some development has has probably gone in too close to the forest since the uh, since the act was passed. Uh, there are places where uh, regional growth area is smack up against a forest area. That's that's going to be a problem if it isn't a problem today or this year, it, it is at some point going to be a problem. Um, and that's one of the realities that, that we have to live with. But the, the, um, the forest itself uh, requires fire in order to be regenerated, in order to maintain the ecology, the, the, the pygmy pines. Part of why they're short is because of their uh, relationship to fire. Another major initiative of the Byrne administration was the authorization for casino gambling in Atlantic City. I assume that you voted for uh, the casino referendum while you were in the assembly. I think that was passed after I left, but I did oppose it. I remember uh, talking to Steve Persky and uh, having a very intense conversation while I was in the assembly but I don't think we voted on it while I was there. If we did, I voted against it. I, uh, I, but it was, yeah, I, I've, I've reflected on that since, and you know, I don't know whether I would vote the same way today, but that was how I felt at the time. What were your reasons for opposing it then? Well, I didn't think that casino gambling was the uh, way to resolve the problems of Atlantic City. Uh, the way I look at it now is it probably was the last chance for Atlantic City. So I, that's why I say I think I would think about it differently now. You know, I thought there were, there were social reasons not to have a, an area dependent upon gambling. And, uh, but, you know, now gambling is so widespread, I guess that view doesn't, uh, isn't very prevalent anymore. And I think my own ideas about it have probably uh, softened. Well, given the major investment and development in Atlantic City and the area immediately outside the city, uh, how do you sort of view the Pinelands uh, with Atlantic City in terms of what would have happened without the Pinelands Protection Act? Without the Pinelands Protection Act, with passage of casino and gambling and the development in Atlantic City, I think the uh, development of the whole Pinelands area would have accelerated and would have been, um, uh, we would have lost that natural resource. I think there's no question about it. The pressures from development have been tremendous, even with the Pinelands Act. Um, I think that looking back at it, there it would have been beneficial to have some sort of regional planning entity be passed along with casino gambling to address the development of Atlantic City and the surrounding area up to the Pinelands as some sort of transitional area or something because what's happened is that the Pinelands regional growth towns have experienced intense pressure for development. Uh, I think the, the idea was that Atlantic City would, would develop, and it has to some extent. But the new employees in 
Atlantic City, many of them are choosing to live in Egg Harbor Township, Hamilton Township, Galloway, all of which are regional growth areas within the Pinelands. Uh, just to put this into perspective, within the Pinelands, we have nine management areas. We have, they range from preservation, where we allow almost no development, up to regional growth, which is where we attempt to concentrate the uh, planned development. And they happen to be regional growth areas. But the pressures have been so great that uh, those towns have had, in some cases, I think they've had almost more than they can handle. There's, there's, an, there's enough to be said that some, in some instances, Egg Harbor Township, for example, there probably was not, not enough done locally either to, um, to manage it. And uh, they're doing much better now. Uh, the, we were able to get a... Uh, the Pinelands Commission was able to get a grant from the Dodge Foundation to assist them with some some planning, and things have things have calmed down there a little bit. We also uh, reduced their growth numbers by some, which was also some help some help for them. But I think if there had been some transitional region, some regional planning associated with the seas, with uh, casino gambling, some of that could have some of that uh, uh, pressure could have been alleviated. You mentioned the failure to get a regional development agency to oversee Atlantic City-related development, which Governor Byrne has mentioned as what he thinks may have been the largest failure of his whole administration. Anything else that, looking back on it from your tenure, uh, both in the legislature and in the Department of Environmental Protection, that you wished could have been done then, which may haunt us now. Cool. <laughs> oh, that's not fair to ask me that <laughs> now. <laughs> you can think about that a little All bit. All right. I mean, I, I, I personally, I've always felt that we, um, although we did a great job with Liberty Park, that I still think there's so much potential there that hasn't been realized. Mm -hmm. And although I think during the Byrne administration, we got it pretty much as far as we could, I feel that Subsequent administrations could have done much more in terms of making it a really spectacular attraction. Well, one area that I think continues to haunt, as I <clears throat> mentioned back in the beginning of the interview, is uh, the whole issue of managing floods, which has become, has continued to be a matter of urgency in the state from time to time, in more recent years once again. And we have not done enough in my opinion, and we talked about it then, and we never really tackled it, to manage growth in flood-prone areas. And to allow, there's been too much um, uh, development in areas during dry years that then subsequently are inundated. And we, we see it again in uh, the Passaic River Basin, the Pompton River Basin, the Delaware River Basin, the Greenbrook Basin, communities inundated again and again and uh, and yet and to some extent this is also true with fire these disasters occur and we allow people to go back and rebuild at the exact same place and PS by the way they also got insurance there's something wrong with that system and it's not a new concern I know we were concerned about it then and we are still concerned about it. Well, now that you mentioned flood control, another issue that Governor Byrne faced in his first year, I don't think the legislature had a lot of involvement, was whether to build the Tox Island Dam on the Delaware. Uh, do you think in retrospect that may have been a mistake in terms of flood control or water supply? Uh, no, I thought he made the right decision on Tox Island. I, I do remember it. Uh, the legislature didn't have a lot uh, of involvement in it, but because the environmental community was very opposed to Tox Island Dam, uh, I, I certainly was involved in it from that perspective. The, um, I know that the, when Rocco Ricky was commissioner of DEP, he said we would come to rue the day that that decision was made because we would need the dam for water supply in the 21st century. And 
well, now we're in the 21st century. And, um, and I don't know enough about whether or not that is going to come true or not. But in terms of uh, the, the costs of doing that, in terms of the cost to, of losing the land and losing the free-flowing river, I just think there are other ways to solve the flood problem than to build this enormous dam and, and stop the free-flowing Delaware River. Okay. Well, let's go back uh, to the chronological timeline a bit. Pinelands Protection Act does get enacted after a very long struggle in the legislature. Uh, discuss, I guess, the department's sort of implementation of the program and the creation of the commission that you now chair. Well, it was um, those of us in the department who had worked on this for so many years had really developed a sense of ownership. And all of a sudden, we were required to turn this over to the commission. And, and that was a little awkward. And there was some friction. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I felt, I think there were others who felt just a lot of uh, uh, discomfort about giving this up. Was we had worked on it for so long, and now, you know, the commission came in and they had their authority, and they had been appointed by the governor, and or at least the seven of them who had been appointed by the governor wanted to get going. And um, and I, I give a lot of credit to um, to Terry Moore for smoothing that out. And uh, I remember at least one conversation that he and I had, and um, he was very diplomatic, and he was. He he was very uh, uh, adept at handling that 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 time period and those feelings. So that um, but there was um, you know we had people working on acquisitions, and that was still going to go on. The the Pinelands acquisition was still going on from Green Acres because the commission doesn't own land, but we had people working on regulation. We had people. There was a sense of ownership, and. Um, uh, the new commissioners came in, and and uh, and they had a sense of ownership. It was now theirs. So it, that transfer was a little uncomfortable. But you know, the bottom line was this was the governor's initiative, and we all had to get on board, and we did. Of course, Terry Moore was the first executive director. Correct. Yes. And the first chairman was Franklin Parker. I Frank think. Parker. Yes, and, and a, a wonderful man. Uh, what a what a splendid choice that the governor made in uh, appointing Frank to that position. And also Terry Moore, the first executive director. I mean, he, he did a, he, he, I think he has still got some scars from arrows in his back from the tough, tough days at the beginning when he had to go in and tell communities, you can do this and you can't do that, and tell individuals you can do this and you can't do that. And, and as I say now, not that it's always a smooth ride, because of course it's not, but um, we don't have those kinds of issues anymore with the almost never with the municipalities, mm. and um, and the developers, the developers will put up their case, but you know they send in their lawyers and we get our lawyers, and the lawyers sit down and they talk to each other and they they figure it out, and uh, so and the the individual applications are almost exclusively handled by the the local governments with. Uh, overview from the Pinelands Commission. So looking back now uh, as chair of the Pinelands Commission, do you think essentially the goals of the Pinelands Protection Act have been met? Yes, I do. Uh, the water has been protected. The land has been protected. In the preservation area, there's virtually no development. The development has been steered to the areas where the development is supposed to occur. Sometimes people get a little uh, lack in an understanding about what is supposed to go on there. But it's not a national park, it's not a state park. It's an area designated for regional, to be protected by regional planning, which means you have a, a multiplicity of zoning that allows different things in different areas depending upon the ecology. So there will be some development. And, uh, uh, but the development that has occurred has occurred where it should develop, in, in towns that had already started to develop, in areas that are along the major corridors, and so forth. And, um, and we've 
since the Pine Lands Act was passed, we have doubled the amount of land that is in public ownership, so that now more than half of the land is in some kind of public ownership, which is for the most part state. It's some county and, and some uh, nonprofit. But uh, it's permanently protected. Uh, some of it is by uh, deed restrictions or transfer development rights. So through all of those mechanisms, over half, uh, uh, going approaching 55% of the land, is permanently protected. And there was uh, much criticism from the agricultural community when the Pinelands program was being debated in the 1970s. Again, looking back, how have they fared under the preservation program? Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, cranberry and blueberry agriculture are uh, uh, designated for special protections under the Comprehensive Management Plan. We have what we call the special agricultural areas, and that's berry, agri berry agriculture. And those are two uh, very important crops in New Jersey. Um, and they, they depend, uh, particularly cranberries, depend on water. And they, they have been um, designated for special protections. So they are, they are thriving. They are, from time to time, subject to the vagaries of, of the market, but that is, is not related to the, um, uh, the environment. The um, other agriculture has slightly increased in the Pinelands. Um, it's done better in the Pinelands than it has in the rest of the state, slightly better, not a lot better. Um, we have an economist on staff, and we monitor, under, with federal funding, we monitor the economic impact annually. So we pretty much know so, uh, uh, property taxes have increased at a slower rate, property values, properties have retained their values at a higher rate. So the economy of the Pinelands in general is, uh, is, excellent, is very good and doing better than the state as a whole. And, uh, and as I said before, the berry agriculture is, uh, receives special protections. Now you mentioned that your economist believes the land values have sort of kept pace with the overall inflation in real estate? Yes, yeah, actually, uh, yes. So and taxes have increased less, but land values have, have, uh, land values have kept pace with the state as a whole. So most, of, if not all, of the criticisms that were being laid at the program in the 1970s really haven't uh, panned out in terms of reality. I think that, that maybe for some individuals they have, but in terms of Pinelands wide, no, they haven't. And, and quite the contrary, as I said uh, previously in the interview, the, uh, for the most part, the municipalities have welcomed the Pinelands Commission to help them to manage growth. Okay. What other uh, issues or topics would you like to talk about uh, for the rest of the Byrne administration during your tenure in the department? If any. <laughs> <laughs> well, I left um, a year and a half before the end of the Byrne administration. So, I mean, I think that the, really, the Pinelands kind of wraps it up for me. Okay. And what was your next step? I went to the uh, United States Department of the Interior uh, at the end of the Carter administration where I uh, ran a national recreation program. But that didn't last too long because uh, President Carter was not reelected. So I came back to New Jersey and I went to the Department of Labor and Industry and uh, after that I went into the private sector. How did uh, those other positions sort of compare to your tenure in state government? Well, the best job I ever had was at the Department of Environmental Protection. I loved the work. I liked the people. Uh, I felt a sense of real purpose. And, uh, and the, the, uh, the tone of the government was what I thought government should be. It felt like public service, and that was a good thing. Looking back now, uh, and your career isn't finished by a long shot, but how has government and politics changed in New Jersey over the, over the course of your uh, career? The big change to, that I observe is the amount of money that is required to run a campaign for, 
for a state legislative seat. Uh, you know, I when I ran, the first campaign was cost eleven thousand dollars, and the second one was twenty two thousand or something. It's figure something like that, and those are laughable amounts now. And I think that the, the money that is required um, leads to so many other things. It leads to uh, fundraising abuses, and it leads to in, inappropriate influence of, of donors, and and so on. And so I think the money in politics are, uh, is, you know, money is such a corrupting influence in politics, or it can be. And um, I think, you know, uh, the public financing is an idea uh, that came and went, and maybe it's time to think about it again. Is money or other factors leading to different types of people running for the legislature in New Jersey? Well, certainly I don't see... Um, I, I think it must be. I mean, I haven't done an analysis of it, but certainly it's an impediment for women. It's, it's probably an impediment for minorities. I think that the people who have money uh, know people who have money, and so people with money are and those are supported by themselves and their friends, and um, so money is it is changing who can who can be a candidate now. I've watched with interest this um, effort that is being made to qualify people for um, public financing for legislative races, and I think it will be interesting to see how that pans out. Um, I I hope it I hope it is a, a trend. How about state government? Do you think different types of people are being attracted to public service? Uh, than they used to be, or is it better, worse, or can't you tell? Well, I think Ronald Reagan made public service and public servants the enemy, and I don't think we we're over that yet. Uh, what I said before was, D when I was at DEP, it felt like public service, and that was a good thing. That's all I ever wanted to do was public service. I thought that was an honorable thing to do, um, but. He made, he made public servants uh, the enemy. He made government itself the enemy. And I think we're still living with that legacy. Now that, that very well may be changing. And I, I would hope that it is. But uh, I think that, uh, and I've, I've seen some instances in New Jersey where uh, governors were elected and came in and just wholesale lopped off the the professionals uh, in in departments, without any thought for what they were doing and for what contributions they were making, and I just read that the, um, I mean, one of the problems with the pension system was that the the um, retirement incentive that was given uh, there was a there was another side to that where people they were supposed to keep those jobs vacant, but the departments couldn't function with those department with those jobs vacant, so they had to fill them again. So you lost this whole professional class, and then you didn't, they didn't save the money anyway. So, um, and I, I mean, maybe that was because of this, this environment of, of uh, denigrating public service. I don't know. Be, uh, it would require some study and thought. But um, I, I, I'm always hopeful. I mean, I, I hope that, that the public financing uh, is resurrected. And and that we can see a more uh, a diverse uh, uh, elected officials and that the professionals in government can be respected once again. Betty, we started uh, talking primarily at the stage where you were an adult and uh, had a family and were thinking about uh, politics and uh, as well as your teaching career. Let's take us back earlier, talk about your parents, your upbringing, and uh, bring us back, I guess, to the point where you become an adult uh, in uh, Berkeley Heights. Well, I grew up in rural Pennsylvania. Um, my parents both uh, went to eighth grade. Um, I, I, I grew up in a, a country house without plumbing and went to a country school, a two-room country school. And where there were not a lot of books. And um, um, I grew up during the Depression, so 
my family always, my father, my, my parents always had, had work, so we were not among the most unfortunate. I mean, that was, the, that was the line. If you had work or you didn't have work, it really wasn't what kind of work you did. I mean, they were, uh, my mother was a factory worker, and my father, uh, my father had a bread route. Drove, you know, when people used to get, have bread and milk delivered to their houses. And I started working on the um, on the bread truck when I was about seven, and um, and that didn't seem terrible. That's what everybody did. And um, but I went to my, for my mother. I had I had a sister. I was the younger of two sisters, two girls, and um, for my mother, she who wanted her daughters to be educated. That meant a high school diploma. So that's what I did. I went through high school, and um, I graduated from high school, and I got, I got a job. And, and when I was 19, I went to California and married my high school sweetheart, who was in the Marine Corps. And we lived in California for a year and a half, and he went to Korea. And while he was in Korea, our first child was born. So I was a stay-at-home mom. There wasn't even a term for it then. It just stayed home. Hmm. And uh, when my husband was discharged from the Marine Corps, uh, he came back to doing uh, manual labor, decided that he wanted to go to college, which was a really scary thought, but that's what he wanted to do. And uh, we moved to Trenton, and he went to Ryder College. And Ryder was really reaching out for veterans in those years. That was in the uh, mid-50s. And uh, so he, uh, he went to college, and he... He uh, got his bachelor's and got his master's at NYU, and we moved up to North Jersey. And, the, and um, so when he was finished with his uh, graduate work, and I sort of looked around and I said, I think it's my turn. <laughs> and we lived about four blocks, five blocks from Jersey City State College. So I decided to go over there and just take a course or two. And it got me started, and I, I got my degree there. and. Uh, uh, by going summers and and uh, uh, taking a full course load after I once got started, I was graduated in four and a half years. And, and you said you started to get a little bit politically active while in college, right? Yeah, um, Bill Maxwell was the uh, president then, and uh, and he uh, Bill was a had studied had gotten his uh, doctorate I think in the study of the the um, African Americans, and and at that time it was called the Negro in America, and um, he really got us interested. He taught a course, the history of the Negro in America, at the college level, and it got me really, really interested. And that was probably 1965. I graduated in '67, so that was probably 1965. And the riots, the riots, and all of a sudden, all the lights started going on. And I had started college as a special ed major. I was going to teach special education. And I had a very astute sociology teacher who said to me, you really don't belong in special ed. You ought to be in social science. And I switched. And people said, oh, you'll never get a job. And I decided that that wasn't the thing to be worrying about at that time, that this was what I really loved to do. And uh, then I had another professor who was um, uh, Dr. Norman Beck who was our political science professor. And he had us do a practicum in our senior year where we had to work with our local committee man of either party and, uh, and do the and be, kind of basic nuts and bolts, registering voters and um, getting the vote out and that sort of thing. So that was, uh, that was my first, except for having worked once or twice on, uh, at the polls on election day, that was my first real connection to uh, to politics. And what's your family up to now? How many grandchildren? And oh, I have, uh, well, both of my sons are married and I have five grandchildren. Two live on the West Coast, three live here in New Jersey, and uh, um, see lots of them and spend a lot of time with them. Before we close, any final thoughts on Brendan Byrne or on your time in government or on New Jersey? Well, I never would have thought when I was growing up in Pennsylvania 
that I would have these experiences. I remember bringing my mother um, several years before she died, bringing her to Trenton to show her what I was doing because not only, I mean, my parents were Republicans and they had no idea where I came from politically. And, but always, you know, I was their daughter, it didn't matter. Uh, but it was, it was a, a, a completely different experience for them to, and so I brought, I, I brought her to Trenton and uh, took her in to see Governor Byrne and uh, it was quite a thrill for her to, to meet a governor and he was, as you know, very engaging and very nice to her and uh, gave her a picture and signed it the best to Betty's mother and, and that was in her, her things when, uh, when she died. So it was, uh, uh, I appreciated that, and it was, uh, it was a heartwarming experience. It's one of the things I remember. Thank you.